On November 23, 2020, Nicholas Kristof, the candidate for governor of Oregon, made a seemingly innocent tweet about a 23-year-old college grad student. Only 2% of America's foster youth graduate from a four-year college, so it's thrilling that Mackenzie Fierston, a first-gen, low-income foster youth, graduated from At Penn and just won a Rhodes Scholarship and works to improve foster care for others. What would eventually stand out about this tweet is a single phrase used, first-gen, low-income foster youth. These six words would have huge moral and legal implications for the three parties involved in this bizarre story. Firstly, Mackenzie herself, the victim of all of this. Secondly, the University of Pennsylvania, specifically Beth A. Winkelstein, Deputy Provost, Louisa Shepard, News Officer at Penn Today, the university's main news provider, Gabriel Escobar, Editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and, coincidentally, the husband of Louisa Shepard, Amy Gunn. Gutman, president of UPenn and a professor of political science with, ironically, a special interest and emphasis on ethics, and Wendy S. White, senior vice president and general counsel at UPenn, and the third party involved, the Rhodes Trust, responsible for the highly competitive selection of 32 US native Rhodes Scholars fully funded four-year postgraduate experience at the University of Oxford. The story of Mackenzie is an example of something truly wrong with modern elite higher education. Like unregulated corporations, yielding the power of small nations, elite universities are yielding that same unchecked power over research and knowledge creation. Like corporations, their agenda is not to better society, to cultivate the minds of the most deserving and passionate. Their unfair and discriminatory business model of marketized education, conditional donations and investments is about nothing more than profit and prestige, something that goes blatantly against the non profit badge of honor they parade. It doesn't matter who get them there or who must be sacrificed along the way. Now, they are multi-million pound businesses with complex leadership teams, human resources departments, mission statements, international strategies, communications executives, and directors of enterprise. It's no fortuitous coincidence that these same universities are now doing just as every modern corporate rebranding is, becoming politically correct, woke, sustainable, and presenting themselves as having a moral and social conscience before all else. And, just like modern corporate rebranding, this is absolute horseshit and is about nothing else beyond preparing itself for the next generation of socially conscious and environmentally aware consumers, Gen Z students. Mackenzie Fierston is a stark example of how elite universities have failed miserably when it comes to allegedly being at the center of social change, mobility, and using education for the good of all. It also shows how shallow and baseless their social justice rebranding branding is, and how, at the end of the day, students and academics are no more than their corporate equivalent, exploited customers of, and workers for, the mammoth institution and its less than utilitarian interests. Part 1. Who is Mackenzie Fierston? Mackenzie Fierston is a 24-year-old woman from St. Louis, Missouri. She graduated from UPenn, summer cum laude, with a degree in political science. Although UPenn is currently withholding her degree, her master's degree in social work, Mackenzie has successfully completed her master's degree. Now, Mackenzie came to media attention very recently for two main reasons. The first, she was selected as a Rhodes Scholar, one of 32 American-based graduate students offered a fully funded place to study at the University of Oxford. Out of 2,300 candidates, Mackenzie was one of the lucky few selected by the Rhodes Trust, based on her stellar application, her academic record, and research interests. The second reason involves an alleged anonymous email that was sent to both the Rhodes Trust and to UPenn admission officials. This email was apparently sent following an interview which Mackenzie gave with the Philadelphia Inquirer about being selected as a Rhodes Scholar. Rather than being, as stated in the Inquirer, a first-generation, low-income student and former foster youth, Mackenzie was actually the middle-class daughter of a radiologist. Her grandfather was a college graduate, she attended private school all her life, and she hadn't spent more than 12 months in foster care after accusing her mother of trying to kill her. This anonymous email included photo evidence of Mackenzie skydiving, horseback riding, and white water rafting. The sender accused Mackenzie of being blatantly dishonest in the representation of her childhood. An investigation by both UPenn and the Rhodes Trust began. An undergraduate essay written by Mackenzie, as well as her admissions essay, were brought to the limelight, the contents of which revealed that she had suffered abuse so severe that she was hospitalized in a pediatric 
pediatric intensive care unit as a teenager. Yet what I find most interesting here is why the Philadelphia Inquirer was so adamant to pursue and follow up on this anonymous email. Surely the author of the piece, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Wendy Ruderman, would have done her research, would have known what she was writing about. In order to answer this question, we have to go back to September 2018. On September 11th of 2018, 38-year-old graduate student Cameron Driver suddenly and unexpectedly experienced what was described as seizure-like activity in connection with a cardiac arrest. At the time, Driver was in class in the basement of the Castor Building at 3701 Locust Walk. Driver was pursuing a master's degree in social work. Two years later, on August 18th of 2020, the family of Driver filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the University of Pennsylvania. The reason for the family filing this lawsuit derives from Mackenzie herself. In January of 2020, Fearston was an undergraduate pursuing her final semester of her senior year at UPenn. Like Driver two years before her, Mackenzie was attending a class on campus in the basement of the Castor building. Now, at some point during Mackenzie's time in this building, she suffered a seizure. Now, for reasons that were not initially disclosed, it took emergency services over an hour to get to Mackenzie. The reason for this made Mackenzie after she had spent five days in hospital, three of which in intensive care, to find out why this had been the case. The classes that Driver and Mackenzie had been attending two years apart were in the basement of the Castor building. Due to the inaccessibility of the Castor building, and specifically its basement, and the Penn defendant's improper emergency protocol, it took more than an hour for emergency personnel to remove Fierston from the building. Now, now, what happened to Fierston was incredibly traumatic, specifically when you are waiting an hour for medical attention. She began her own private investigation into what had happened to her and also with what had happened to Driver, particularly considering the parallels between both their medical emergencies. Mackenzie took photographs, she analyzed the building, she determined and found out what had happened to Driver. Fierston then gave all of this information and all of her findings to the widow of Driver. It was then that the family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the University of Pennsylvania. This background context is integral to understanding why Mackenzie is now so prominent in the media. Mackenzie attended high school in St. Louis at the classical Christian private school, Whitefield Academy in Kansas City. It was reported by local newspaper The Pitch that allegedly three teachers recently walked out after refusing to sign a letter advocating for the expulsion of gay students. The school boasts a 100% track record for getting its students into college. Tuition fees reflect why this track record must be so important to parents. $30,000 a year and a student-teacher ratio of 8 to 1 ensures that students come out ethical, confident and successful. Mackenzie was a brilliant student by all accounts. She earned a leadership award and was voted student body president. She excelled at sports, playing on the school's basketball team and making all district on her varsity soccer team. She ran cross country and gained a third degree black belt in taekwondo. She was a straight A student and universally impressed her teachers. Like a lot of young people, Mackenzie's parents were divorced and she was effectively estranged from her father. The prominent parent in her life was her mother, Carrie Morrison, a radiologist. Carrie was a director of breast imaging and mammography before losing her job in 2014. This is very important. Carrie and Mackenzie lived together in the middle class suburb of Chesterfield. And when compared to the national average, Chesterfield is considered one of the top places to live in the whole of the United States. Now, aside from her parents being divorced, an absent father, not getting on with her mother's boyfriend, another very important point 
point, Mackenzie's childhood seemed idyllic. An upper middle class, beautiful young girl, seemingly with the world and its opportunities at her fingertips. Yet this case about Mackenzie really brings to light something that I believe is often considered socially taboo. The prospect of middle class children being victims of absolutely horrendous childhood abuse. Mackenzie's adolescent diaries, her college application and Rhodes Scholar personal statement paint an entirely different and more nuanced picture of her childhood. In all these written sources, Mackenzie's childhood is represented as being no fairy tale. Behind this exterior of privilege and money, Mackenzie alleged years of the most soul-destroying psychological and physical abuse endured at the hands of a radiologist mother Carrie. Mackenzie found herself in a position not often considered as important or even possible. A victim of the kind of abuse not deemed as being possibly associated with her socio-economic background and class, its values and its style of child rearing. I would go so far as to say that it is taboo in modern societies to consider the so-called privileged as being victims of abuse. A harrowing consequence of middle to upper class child abuse is that it is often endured in silence, not only due to fear of retaliation, but especially due to disbelief. Looking at the diaries that Mackenzie kept in the 10th grade, we can see how she grappled with this perplexing reality. Her diary seems to have been the only thing that she could confide in. Labelled the property of Mackenzie C. Morrison, Mackenzie filled 103 pages detailing her home life. She typed a further 42 pages on her laptop. Now, during the extensive and highly invasive investigation by the University of Pennsylvania into Mackenzie's childhood and background, police obtained these 145 pages. The contents of these pages are fairly disturbing and almost exclusively focus on Mackenzie's mother, Carrie. I know this isn't how relationships are supposed to work, right? No matter how hard I try, I can't forget all of the terrible things she said to me, all the awful things she's done to me. At another point, Mackenzie writes that existing in her mother's house is physically, emotionally, and mentally lethal to me. As the works of Roald Dahl and Lemony Snicket so effectively demonstrate, adults are nothing exceptional, especially when it comes to doing the right thing, loving their children unconditionally, and believing their children. Why I mention these works of brilliant fiction is because they focus on children who are seemingly privileged, who are wealthy, who are white. Matilda isn't going hungry. She has parents, siblings, a room. As the current media and public treatment of Mackenzie shows, adults don't believe children whose socio-economic situation does not stereotypically fit into the expectations of child abuse and neglect cases. Just look at Violet, Klaus and Sunny Baudelaire. In the same diary, Mackenzie writes that she's worried about destroying her mum's whole world if police and social services get involved. Aren't your parents meant to love and protect you? She writes on another page. A few pages on, she composes a prose and cons list of making known her mother's abusive behaviour. The cons highlight Mackenzie's dilemma, which no child, rich or otherwise, ought to find themselves in. Could go into foster care, no college money, no car, and, most hard to read, no one could believe me. Mom could convince everyone that I'm crazy. On the prose side of the page, Mackenzie writes, the truth is finally out. I don't have to lie or cover things up and I get out of this dangerous house. To Mackenzie, there seemed no safe way out and there truly wasn't. September 22nd, 2014. Mackenzie's home life and the direction of her life would radically and dangerously change on the night of September 22nd, 2014. From a legal perspective, nobody knows what truly happened that night, aside from Mackenzie and Carrie, because there were no eyewitnesses. But the outcomes of that night resulted in a full police investigation 
litigation, in court hearings, and in Carrie losing custody of her daughter. It also resulted in Carrie losing her job as a radiologist and director. It was as late as 2019 that Mackenzie testified in court about that night. Allegedly, her and Carrie had been arguing at the top of the staircase about Carrie's boyfriend. Enraged, Carrie proceeded to push Mackenzie down the staircase of their two-story house. Once Mackenzie had landed at the bottom of the stairs, Carrie proceeded to strike her multiple times across the face. And after regaining full consciousness, Mackenzie found herself back in her bedroom. The next morning, Mackenzie doesn't remember what happened insofar as how she got to school. She was told that she had driven herself to school. However, when she got there, she collapsed in front of a teacher and was immediately rushed to hospital. Mackenzie would spend a total of 22 days, just over three weeks, in hospital, much of which was spent in intensive care. It was this version of events of that night which Mackenzie chose to make the subject of her admissions essay to UPenn the following year. Carrie, however, tells a completely different story. According to Carrie, Mackenzie and her had the perfect mother-daughter relationship. They did everything together. Carrie would proceed to tell the courts that Mackenzie would be, at times, a difficult and defiant child, and that she suffered from anxiety. Now, according to Carrie's version of events, Mackenzie and she were standing standing at the top of the staircase, trying to remove a piece of chewing gum from Mackenzie's curls. Whilst in vain trying to remove this piece of gum from Mackenzie's hair, Mackenzie jerked backwards and proceeded to fall down two to three steps. Carrie states that Mackenzie landed in the seated position and was completely unharmed. Carrie would subsequently also outright deny ever striking or laying a hand on Mackenzie. However, the following day, Mackenzie would end up in hospital for 22 days. In an email statement to the Chronicle of Higher Education, Carrie stated the following, Mackenzie is deeply loved by her mom and family. Our greatest desire is that Mackenzie chooses to live a happy, healthy, honest, and productive life, using her extraordinary gifts for the highest good. Notably, Mackenzie changed her last name from Morrison to Fierston during her undergraduate years at UPenn. She also has not lived with or been financially financially supported in any way by Carrie since that night on September 22nd, 2014. The transition from childhood to adulthood. Now in this part we are going to focus a little bit more on the University of Pennsylvania and to do this we have to look at the application process to elite universities. At the time that Mackenzie applied to UPenn as an undergraduate student, applicants had to write a 500 word essay titled an accomplishment or event, formal or informal, that marked your transition from childhood to adulthood. Mackenzie's 494-word essay opens with her regaining consciousness in a hospital bed with a feeding tube down her throat. She is only able to open one eye. She cannot smile. Her face seems foreign to her. A trip to the bathroom necessitates an army of nurses. Every single part of her body hurts. And although she doesn't go into detail about how she allegedly obtained these life-threatening injuries, she does, in her conclusion, identify the perpetrator of these injuries. The one who almost killed me. The one who is my mother. She broke me. This event is identified as being that which introduced Mackenzie to the horrors of the world and the reality that home was no safe place against it. From the age of 17 to 18, Mackenzie was in foster care. She stayed with several families and she lived mainly with five other foster siblings. Whenever Mackenzie, during her proceedings with the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is referred to as a foster youth. It is this time period that is being referred to. Mackenzie did remain in foster care after her 18th birthday, even though, legally speaking, she was no longer a ward of the state. This was in order to complete her 
final year of high school and it was during this time that she wrote her application to the University of Pennsylvania. At the time of applying to UPenn, Mackenzie was what you would call a foster child. She was in foster care. Her mother had lost all rights over her. She was not supported financially or in any way maternally by her mother or by her biological family. She was supporting herself by working several different jobs. Looking at the media and press coverage of Mackenzie Fearston's story in the past month, none of this is referenced to or made clearly known. Mackenzie is presented as being dishonest about her childhood and upbringing, as misleading the university and the Rhodes Trust about her childhood. She is very specifically represented as lying about being what UPenn calls, and I quote, a first-gen low-income foster youth, abbreviated an FGLI individual. After being sent this anonymous email following Mackenzie's acceptance into the Rhodes Scholarship Program, UPenn conducts their own extensive and highly invasive investigation into Mackenzie's childhood. Importantly, at this time, Mackenzie is also meant to stand as a key witness regarding the death of Mr. Cameron Driver. Professor Beth Winkelstein, the deputy provost at UPenn, holds a virtual meeting with the former graduate student and is responsible for the investigation into her childhood. In a transcript of their Zoom meeting, Professor Winkelstein asks whether medical records will back up that Mackenzie suffered broken ribs and facial injuries. Even though Mackenzie says yes, she has subsequently asked repeatedly what really happened on the night of September 22nd of 2014. This interrogation lasts a considerable amount of time. Crying, Mackenzie says at one point, my mother tried to kill me. Mackenzie is also questioned about the personal statement she submitted as part of her Rhodes Scholarship application. In it, she details the events which transpired after her release from hospital. Following her 22 days hospitalized, Mackenzie was placed in to foster care. Her personal statement to the Rhodes Trust opens with her moving into her first foster home. I dropped the trash bag of donated clothes and sink to the floor, she writes. The statement is not only about her. In it, she details the four other foster kids she encountered during her time in the system. She reflects on happier times with her foster siblings after adjusting to her newfound living situation. Her life in foster care is described as a relatively content one before the harsh realities of the world set in and altered all of their lives. Chandra is institutionalized for the seventh time. Darren and Will are incarcerated. Casey is terminally ill. Why does this keep happening to us? Why does no one care? First generation and low income, according to the University of Pennsylvania. You know, when I reflect on my time in elite higher education, I always come back to its very effective and incredibly well churned out advertising and branding. And this branding is very specific because it emphasizes more than anything else that these institutions in the modern age are here in order to instigate and be the leaders and beacons of social change, of social mobility, of ending class inequality and discrimination. And it is these institutions which I would argue more than most are heavily invested in an image of being on the side of identity politics. Universities have their taglines. UPenn has its tagline, which I see everywhere when looking into this case first generation low income. At UPenn, first generation low income students are collectively called FGLI. These students are considered to be from identifiably underprivileged backgrounds. What is intriguing to dissect here is how and why Mackenzie considered herself to be such a student when, at least in looking at the overt facts of the matter, she is in no way underprivileged. The only things which seemingly place her at a social disadvantage according to our age of identity politics and postmodern thought, is her sexuality, Mackenzie is queer, and her sex, she is female.
I think it's a, it's a balance of, you know, sharing whatever you feel comfortable with, because I think depending on the background we all come from um, and different like marginalized identities that we all hold, there's sometimes a lot of pressure to like share your story and like, you know, everything that you've overcome and, you know, kind of the expression I think that comes up is like poverty porn and wanting to like continually being pressured by your school when you get to a higher education institution or, or even in high school to share your story and, you know, thank donors and whatever the case is. Um, and I believe we can see this in looking at UPenn's own definition of first-generation low-income students. The thing with elite universities is that all have a very competitive and specific selection process. Applications to several elite institutions will not be the same. Every personal statement and essay crafted to fit the individual criteria set by each admissions office. At UPenn, the first-generation low-income student organization has been at the center of cultivating UPenn's official definition of what makes such a student. According to the organization, a student is considered first generation and low income if they are the first member of their family to pursue higher education at an elite university. Note the descriptive elite and then note Mackenzie. Generically speaking, Mackenzie would not be considered a first generation student because her mother, a radiologist, obviously went to university and, as has been made known, her grandfather went to university. However, according to UPenn's definition of what constitutes a first generation student, Mackenzie most definitely is it. Neither her mother or her grandfather went to an elite institution. None of them studied at an Ivy League institution. Mackenzie is, therefore, by definition, according to the definition given by UPenn's FGLI organization, a first-generation student. If that isn't enough, Mackenzie was also in foster care and had been for almost a year at the time of applying to study at UPenn as an undergraduate student. She had not seen or lived with with her mother or her biological family since the horrific events of September 22nd. She was estranged from her parents, estranged from her previous life, bar that of completing her senior year at high school. Aside from this, by modern society standards, she is deemed privileged, at least according to the over 15,000 word document summarizing and advising action to the Rhodes Committee on what to do about Mackenzie. The committee was advised by another and far more thorough 31-page document written by UPenn's Office of Student Conduct. They were advised to withdraw Mackenzie's scholarship offer. Both documents went extensively into Mackenzie's childhood and background, interviewing alleged whistleblowers from her past and those connected to the case following the night of September 22nd. But why did UPenn do this? At face value, this doesn't make a lot of sense. It is in UPenn's best interest for Mackenzie to go to Oxford to be a representative of UPenn, which is exactly what initially the university portrayed her as, portraying themselves ultimately as being responsible for Mackenzie's achievements. But why did UPenn do all of this? Mackenzie is a student activist and has very openly and publicly criticised UPenn, especially insofar as its refusal to pay pilot tax is concerned. Pilot taxes are financial contributions that property tax exempt organizations, such as UPenn, voluntarily make to local governments. Nearly 700 Penn faculty and staff members have signed a petition calling on the university to pay pilots in order to support the Philadelphia public school system, which is projecting significant budget cuts and job losses due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on my research, students at UPenn have been very critical of the university not paying pilot taxes. Most elite universities do in the United States. Mackenzie has been at the forefront of a lot of this criticism since starting at UPenn. Alongside her professor, Tojo Gos, Mackenzie was one of several students who drafted a petition on May 21st of 2020 addressed to Amy Gutman, school deans and university board of trustees. This is the beginning and now we are going to keep following with ensuring that Penn takes tangible actions to follow up 
up and meet with demands. Fiesten said to the Daily Pennsylvanian, I think once we're back on campus, that could include our own demonstration, more actions. This is not the end. Throughout her time at UPenn, Mackenzie seems to have been a very prominent figure within the local community. In presenting Mackenzie as a liar and a fraud, the media seems to have completely dismissed the fact that she is the perfect candidate for the Rhodes Scholarship. Her record on local activism in Philadelphia, where she currently lives, and also in her hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, is commendable. I also found that she has, in fact, been very open about having attended private school when interviewed by a local St. Louis paper. Mackenzie has not once, based on my own very extensive research, called herself growing up poor. She has never referred to herself as being poor. That has all been down to journalists and their own interpretation, presumably in order to sell a story, which is obviously what they do. Similarly to how the pen today and UPenn itself promotes its so-called disadvantaged, marginalized students in order to appease its audience, its prospective students, its Gen Z students. What Mackenzie's activism demonstrates to me is that she has far greater an allegiance to the local community than she does to UPenn and to higher education as an institution. She is willing to publicly criticize UPenn and I have found that on numerous occasions she is quoted directly by the Daily Pennsylvanian, outright calling out UPenn, starting and being at the forefront of petitions, writing directly to Amy Gutman, and notably not demonstrating the kind of gratitude that UPenn has emphasized she ought to be demonstrating as opposed to filing a lawsuit against them. This is another general problem with elite universities, which I find. In order to attract donors, they present themselves as being highly charitable. They have their taglines, such as UPenn's low-income first-gen students. They present themselves as being the source of opportunity, as being the source of students progressing in life. Ultimately, what I see Mackenzie as being is a nuisance, a student activist who really is not afraid to speak out against the hand that feeds her, if that makes sense. The final straw was clearly her investigation into driver's death. It is as if overnight, Louise Shepard and Penn Today went from applauding Mackenzie via Twitter, via Penn Today, via Louise Shepard's intimate connection to the Philadelphia Inquirer, to outright annihilating her character and credibility as a witness to her own existence and life, even without reference to Mackenzie's testimony itself, but more so to just looking at the objective facts of what she has done, especially with her life since being at UPenn, with her aspirations in the future. None of it adds up to the image painted by UPenn's admissions officials and general bureaucracy. Allegedly, according to Mackenzie's lawyer, Louisa Shepard fed information to her husband, who was ultimately responsible for commissioning then Inquirer journalist Wendy Rudderman to follow up on her original piece about Mackenzie with a lengthy expose. Rudderman was working on this piece for a year, instructed to dig up as much dirt as possible regarding Mackenzie, and ultimately derived from a so-called and alleged anonymous email, conveniently sent at or around the time that Driver's wrongful lawsuit was filed. I also say this with reference to how differently Mackenzie relays her experiences, her life experiences, relative to how UPenn and the Philadelphia Inquirer portray them. I find this especially interesting because Mackenzie talks about this experience. She talks about having rarely seen poverty growing up, but how she speaks about it is seeing it as somebody who got involved in her local community, got involved in the homeless population. In no way could I find evidence or information pertaining to her claiming that she herself experienced these things. Seeing how people my own age navigated everything and had to deal with all these issues, like my friend Darnisha and I both had to take the ACT and she didn't take it because she didn't have a pencil. We shared so many experiences but had such different opportunities. Note this final sentence. Any of us going to Penn has a huge educational advantage. It's super easy to get involved. There's so many opportunities, especially in Philadelphia. Mackenzie 
also completed her clinical master's degree in social work, which UPenn is currently withholding from her. Simultaneously, she also took up work at Philadelphia's Children's Hospital and also worked as a part-time social worker. She works directly with children and adolescents who have been incarcerated. She worked alongside second-term city council member Helen Jim, advising her on policy. Her vision was to pursue a PhD in social policy, something made possible by the Rhodes Scholarship. The Daily Pennsylvanian outlined Mackenzie's research plan for her time at Oxford. Fearston will conduct research on the foster care to prison pipeline, representing a disproportionate risk of incarceration for young people in foster care. Her research will analyze how welfare divisions and social policy in the United States, the United Kingdom and Norway affect the incarceration rate of children in foster care. Upon graduating from Oxford, Fearston plans to return to the United States to work in the Philadelphia community to influence policy regarding the foster care system. Mackenzie's research objectives and her activism and interest and passion for her local community aligns itself perfectly to the guiding principles which allegedly inform the Rhodes Trust. Mackenzie is an ideal Rhodes Scholar based on its own tenets, its own guiding principles. The Rhodes Trust states that it is impatient with the way things are and has the courage to act. Our reputation as the world's most distinguished academic scholarship rests not on the controversial life of our founder, but on the enormous contributions our scholars have made to the world. The Trust placed considerable emphasis on cultivating leaders who will make positive change. Its guiding principles include the paramount place of fidelity to the Trust's mission to develop compassionate, innovative and public-spirited people committed to solving humanity's challenges. Yet it is clearly becoming noticeable that more and more Rhodes Scholars are not entering or contributing to this ultimate tenet of public service, instead opting for finance and corporate careers, business ventures and private law. This is all well and good, except that the scholarship is intended for cultivating public servants. Based on Mackenzie's track record and what she aims to do at Oxford and beyond, she is the perfect Rhodes Scholar. And going off script for a bit, this actually does frustrate me, especially when looking at the Rhodes Scholarship and what it allegedly stands for. According to the criticism that Mackenzie has been receiving, I would make a perfect Rhodes Scholarship, but I personally would make the worst Rhodes Scholar in terms of what it stands for and aims to achieve. I am not a student activist. I am the antithesis of a student activist. I personally have no interest in my local community. I have not invested my time or my interests in making my local community and the world a better place. And yet seemingly, according to the narrative surrounding this, I would make a better candidate. I am a first generation, low income, person of colour. I fill numerous quotas. And in terms of the victimhood industrial complex, I am it. There is a stark difference between how Mackenzie, from her mouth, talks about her time in foster care relative to how the Philadelphia Inquirer and UPenn talk about it. I have seen this process of youth being shuttled from the foster system to the criminal justice system over and over again to people I know. This is something really close to my heart and I feel really privileged to go and do this work because nobody else is going to do it. Committed to research and advocacy to make a positive impact in the world, Mackenzie is so deserving of this prestigious opportunity to build upon her Penn education and experience as a first-generation, low-income student and foster youth, Mackenzie is passionate about championing young people in those communities through her academic, her professional and personal endeavours, dedicating herself to a life of public service. This sounds very familiar, especially when we read Amy Gutman's bio. A first-generation, low-income college student herself, President Gutman has more than doubled the number of students from first-generation, low-income and middle-income families attending Penn. The significance of this tagline and its brand potential is noticeable. To describe Mackenzie as being misleading and canny is, I think, to miss the point of where this information derives from. This information received by the Rhodes Scholarship derives primarily from UPenn, from Beth Winkelstein, particularly from a letter which she wrote to the Rhodes Trust. And this appeared to be allegedly a cleanup job more so than doing the right thing 
Considering the numerous controversies the Rhodes Scholarship itself has gotten into since its founding, it is understandable, I guess, why it followed the lead of UPenn. When UPenn is portraying Mackenzie as a liar and fraud, as somebody taking advantage of the system of FGLI students, for the Rhodes Scholarship to stand up for her seems counterproductive for its own interests, and this is highly disappointing. Professors, administrators and other beneficiaries of the victimhood industrial complex must, with some regularity, crucify an easy in the sense that they are indefensible target. In this case, Mackenzie, for the ubiquitous dishonesty that colleges, by their own policies, impel. In Fearston, they have found their precious pressure release valve, as institutions of higher education concentrate and offload their guilt onto the shoulders of sacrificial individuals. They wash their hands of moral culpability and ensure that they may continue a pass in the business of oppression laundering. On December 21st, 2021, Mackenzie filed a lawsuit against the University of Pennsylvania, specifically the individual officials referenced in this video. Reading UPenn's 130-page response to this lawsuit is telling, and it's indicative of what elite education has regrettably become. The marketization of higher education has truly transformed these institutions. Elite universities have been facing great to scrutiny in recent years. Admissions-related scandals have plagued the reputation and image of these institutions, and this undoubtedly includes the University of Pennsylvania. Simultaneously, elite private universities are the gatekeepers to the American dream. When elite university officials can make or break your life and future with no remorse, based on internal processes allegedly done in the interest of the university brand itself, something is truly wrong. These supposed beacons of upward mobility, of real-world change, integrity and inclusivity will back you and then desert you without a second thought. They will fund you, support you, tolerate you and then disown you without raising an eyebrow. The treatment of Mackenzie Fearston has been, as described eloquently and effectively in a written piece by her former professors, Anne Norton and Roger M. Smith, shameful. Rather than looking to themselves, universities university officials have passed the buck onto a defenseless individual. And this is all because they have the money, the backing, and the bureaucratic mechanisms and means to do so. It is not in their interest to do otherwise. They have quotas to fill, they have targets to hit, donors to attract, fancy dinners to organize and attend. The poor, if not non-existent research and journalistic integrity exhibited by the news media on publicizing this story is deplorable. Our age's concern more with what looks like a label than what in fact is behind that label is disheartening and counterproductive. As this bizarre case and so many others before and after it demonstrate and will demonstrate, elite institutions are proving themselves to be more and more of a joke. I hope that in time, prospective students and staff themselves exploited by these institutions stop laughing because as the Smith so perfectly put it, that joke isn't funny anymore.